Good morning and welcome to the second blog of the um, uh, Exposition to the Great Mother Goddess. Um, in order to fully grasp the uh, discourse uh, presented in the two articles of the Tall Greek to Me Educational Blog Tour entitled The Cult of Hathor Isis and the uh, Mother Archetype, um, it is necessary to provide a brief overview of the Jungian principles used to support my hypothesis on the Divine Feminine and the Great Mother Arch uh, Goddess. The material is drawn from Jung's um, collected works. Um, today, the unconscious stands as the original mind of hum humankind, the primal matrix out of which our species evolved the conscious mind and then developed it over the millennia to the extent um, and the refinement that it has today. Uh, every capacity, every feature of our functioning consciousness was first contained in the unconscious and then found its way uh, from there up to the conscious level. Uh, historically, one of the first individuals of the 20th century to reintroduce um, this idea in the Western world was psychoanalyst Carl uh, Jung. Through years of research and work with the mentally ill, he was able to show that the unconscious is the creative source of all that evolves into the conscious mind and into the total personality of each individual. Um, upon closer inspection of their psychological suffering, he was able to discern that the relationship uh, between conscious and unconscious components of the mind had broken down. This observation was pivotal in his uh, formulating a plausible theory regarding the mechanics of the human soul, namely that the individual psyche was not all that individual but was built upon the foundations of past generations. Uh, this notion that all human beings might share the same subconscious mind or at least certain basic ideas and feelings was inspired by a projected dream he had in which the content discovered on various um, floors of a house were juxtaposed with the periods of human history. Uh, he chose to call this level of the subconscious mind the collective unconscious. Um, as it is common to all humans, the collective unconscious is the level of consciousness described by the ancient philosophers as the sympathy um, of all things. Uh, in fact, Jung separated the mind into three distinct uh, faculties. So we've got the conscious, uh, the personal unconscious and the collective unconscious. Uh, there seems to be a constant flow of energy between these three psychic centers with conscious and unconscious elements meeting in the sphere of dreams, uh, visions, ritual and um, imagination. If we were to compare the mind with an ocean, uh, the atmosphere above would denote consciousness, the surface unconsciousness and its vast depths, the collective unconscious. Uh, in the deepest level of the psyche, um, before we move into the dimension of pure God mind, uh, lies the seed, seeds of man's religious aspirations, the world of ideal forms and the quest for meaning and existence. Uh, ancient philosophers like Plato and Pythagoras were aware of this level of consciousness, but saw it as the sphere of the gods. Herein live the forces uh, which are always present and interact with human lives. Um, yet they actually stood outside, um, you know, outside the world that we know. Uh, they were universal, timeless, um, and didn't pertain to any life or time. Uh, these fields of energy resembled integrated personalities um, and acted on the human race on an impersonal and sometimes personal level. Uh, we experience them in our everyday lives as the great powers. They sometimes um, might overwhelm us, they might strengthen us, they sometimes help us, and they sometimes threaten us, um, they sometimes liberate us, or they possess us, um, depending on uh, which particular phase of spiritual evolution we're at. Um, these archaic components which entered the individual psyche within, uh, without any direct line of tradition were termed archetypes by Jung. Unlike the ancients, Jung proposed that archetypes didn't come from the cupola of the sky or Mount Olympus in Greece, but from deep within ourselves. Um, and it is to he, uh, to whom we owe that concept. Uh, he saw them as pre-existing first patterns um, that formed the basic blueprint for the major dynamic components of the human personality. A plethora of psychological archetypes existing in the abode of the collective unconscious determines human behavior unconsciously, but in accordance with laws and independently of the um, experience of the individual. An archetype com is composed of emotional dynamic components 
symbolism and carries with it a material component. Almost no real human being fits one type uh, because each type is, um, by its nature, idealized models of character traits or behavioral patterns. Uh, we find characters in mythology, literature, and figures in our dreams that might, you know, fit into one particular type, but um, human beings, uh, or at least real human beings, are a combination of different archetypes that uh, form one um, many multifaceted human personality. Uh, some really common ones include the virtuous maiden, uh, the heroine, the miser, father time, uh, the courageous warrior, and the Puritan. The human soul is also an archetype, and it appears quite frequently in dreams as the opposite sex of the dreamer. So for men, uh, it would be a woman, and for women, it would, be, it would appear as a male. Um, in males, it's called the animus, sorry, the anima, and in females, it's called the animus. Um, I think that the most influential and greatest of these um, is the archetype that belongs to the sphere of the Divine Feminine, um, and that's that of the Great Mother. Um, in retrospect, it can be inferred that when analytical psychology speaks of a primordial image or archetype for the Great Mother, uh, it is referring not to any concrete image existing in time or space, but to an inward image at work in the human soul. Um, the symbolic expression of this uh, psychic phenomenon is to be found in the figures of the great goddess represented in the myths and artistic creations of mankind. And for the purpose of this exposition, the uh, Egyptian goddess Hathor Isis. The effect of this archetype may be followed through the whole of human he uh, the whole of history, for we can demonstrate its workings in the rites, myths, uh, symbols and of early mankind, and also in the dreams, fantasies, and creative works of the sound, as well as the mentally ill of our day. The term Great Mother, as a partial aspect of the archetypal feminine, is a late abstraction worshipped, uh, worshipped and portrayed many thousands of years before the appearance of the term. Yet, even in this relatively late term, it is evident that the combination of the words mother and great is not a combination of concept, but of emotionally coloured symbols. Um, mother, in this connection, does not you know, merely infer to a relationship of affiliation, but also to a complete psychic situation of ego consciousness. Um, and similarly, the term great expresses the symbolic character of superiority that the archetypal figure possesses uh, in comparison with everything human and with creative nature in general. It was Jung's further discovery that the archetypal psyche has a structural uh, rule or ordering principle which unifies the various archetypal contents. Uh, this is the central archetypal archetype of wholeness. Uh, which Jung termed the self, or what we as students um, of the metaphysical call the God mind. Uh, the self is the ordering and unifying center of the total um, of the total soul, both the unconscious and unconscious elements, just as the ego is the center of the conscious personality. We can think of one's ego as the seed of their subjective identity, and one's self as the seed of the unconscious personality. The self is thus the supreme psychic authority and subordinates the ego to it. The self is most simply described as the inner empirical deity and is identical with the imago dei. Um, so Jung has demonstrated that the self has a characteristic phenomenology. It is expressed by certain typical symbolic images called mandalas, uh, all images that emphasize a circle with a center and usually with the additional feature of a square, a cross, or some other representation of quaternity uh, falls into this category. Themes of wholeness, totality, the union of opposites, the central generative point, the world navel, and uh, the axis of the universe, uh, the creative point where God and man meet, the point where transpersonal energies flow into personal life, eternity as opposed to the temporal flux, incom incorruptibility, the inorganic, united paradoxically with the organic, the elixir of life, all refer to the self, the central source of life energy, um, the foundation or the fountain of our being, uh, which is most simply described by many people in many traditions as God. Uh, since <clears throat> these, two <clears throat> these are two autonomous centers of psychic being, 
the relationship between the two becomes vitally important. Uh, the ego's relation to the self uh, is highly prob problematic and uh, corresponds to man's relation to his creator as depicted in religious myth. The myth can be seen as a symbolic expression of the ego-self relationship. Many of the vicissitudes um, of psychological development can be understood in terms of the changing relation between the ego and the self at various stages of psychic growth. Uh, Eric Newman, a student of Jung, depicted symbolically the original psychic state prior to ego consciousness as the Euroboros, uh, using the circular image of the tail leader to represent the primordial self, the original mandala state of totality out of which the individual ego is born. A symbol of the origin and of the opposites contained in it, the Euroboros is the great round in which positive and negative, male and female uh, elements of consciousness, elements hostile to consciousness, and the unconscious elements are intermingled. Uh, in this sense, the Euroboros is also a symbol of the state in which the chaos, um, the unconscious, and the psyche as a whole were undifferentiated and which is experienced by the ego as a borderline state. My two, it's all Greek to me, um, articles titled The Cult of Hathor Isis and the Great Mother mention a maternal Euroboros, and by this I mean the archetypal figure of the self uh, shining through the archetypal feminine figure of the Great Mother. Uh, instead of the combined archetypal feminine and archetypal <coughs> masculine together. <coughs> it is generally accepted among analytical psychologists that the task of the first half of life involves ego development with progressive separation between ego and self, uh, whereas the second half of life uh, requires surrender or at least a rel relativization uh, of the ego as it experiences and relates to the self. Uh, therefore, the current working of formula is first half of life uh, ego-self separation, second half of life, ego-self reintegration or reunion. This process, which can also which can occur multiple times in the course of one's lifetime, Jung called individuation or self-actualization, if you want. Uh, it is something akin to waking up to our total selves and allowing our conscious personalities to develop until they include all the basic elements that are inherent in each of us at the pre-conscious level. The process is lifelong and possesses strong associations with becoming the complete human beings we were born to be. Uh, now, because certain uh, constant relations are demonstrable uh, in the depth psychology of mankind, and because to a certain extent a coordination is possible between psychic phenomena and the historical stages uh, in the development of human consciousness, a critical analysis of the influence of the Great Mother Archetype in the early parts of Western civilization um, is possible. And um, that's the end of this blog, blog number two. Uh, and I'll see you next time for blog number three. See you then.